you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be going through verses 1 to 16 this morning. This past week, uh, I discovered uh, a new app. While I probably should have been preparing for this sermon, I was scrolling through Twitter. And I saw a picture, a video actually, of Charles Spurgeon, who knew there was a video of Charles Spurgeon. A video of Charles Spurgeon singing, I'm never going to give you up, I'm never going to let you down, I'm never going to run around or desert you, by Rick Astley. And I thought to myself, this is an app that I need to have. It's called Wombo if you're interested in in downloading it. But uh, I decided to download this app. And and what this app does is it allows you to take a picture. You can take a selfie, but you can take a picture of anyone you know. And you can turn them into a video of singing and dancing, even though that person never did that in their life. So somewhere floating around in the cloud is a video of your pastor, Rod Foltz, singing and dancing to, I'm never going to give you up, never going to let you down, run around or or desert you. Uh, But what the the technical term uh, for this kind of artificial intelligence is called is a deep fake. And while what I did is a silly internet meme, it's just a funny joke, some people are concerned that as artificial intelligence uh, advances over the years, especially in the coming um, decade, that what, finding the difference between what is real and what is fake is going to be incredibly hard to do, especially with things on the internet. To put it simply, we will need a method to test for authenticity. This morning, I believe God wants, us, wants to show us what authentic Christianity looks like as we take a look at, at the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians. And so that's the title of our message this morning, Authentic Christianity. Let's read here 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. These are the, the words of God through the Apostle Paul. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our, go- in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you yourselves had become dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. Church, if I could leave you with one main idea this morning, one overarching idea that that I would like to take you to take away is this. Authentic Christianity shows itself 
in sincerity, sweat, salvation, and suffering. I'll repeat that. Authentic Christianity shows itself in sincerity, sweat, salvation, and suffering. We'll begin with point one. Authentic Christianity shows itself in sincerity. As you may recall from last week, uh, Pastor Rod preached about the, the apostles coming into Thessalonica. And when they did that, they caused quite a stir in the city. Uh, a riot was formed when, when Paul began preaching in the synagogue, uh, and, and the apostles were quickly driven out of town. This sudden departure and lack of return had left some people wondering if Paul and the rest of the apostles really cared about the Thessalonians. They hadn't come back. What was the deal? Was Paul just another charlatan passing through town with another message seeking to gain some approval or some money? So Paul is going to write to these Thessalonians and tell them that the apostles did not come in vain. In the first verse, he says, you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. If you look back to chapter one, verse five, you see Paul saying, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. See, what Paul is doing here is contrasting the ministry of the apostles with the ministry of other traveling preachers that would have been going around through the day. Christianity was not the only idea that floated around in the ancient world. There were many traveling preachers preaching all kinds of messages. These men would travel from town to town, and most of them had impure motives. They sought money. They sought attention, accolades, glory. And what people in Thessalonica, what the opponents of Paul were saying was, Paul's just another charlatan. All he is out to do is make a quick buck. He does not care about you, church. He doesn't care. The message of Jesus is just a ploy to gain a following. But Paul knows better, and the Thessalonians know better, and therefore Paul appeals to the experience of the Thessalonians to debunk any notions that he might be a con artist. In fact, five times in this letter, Paul is going to say, you yourselves know. You know who I am. You know who we were. We are not fakes. His point, you know we had pure motives when we preached the gospel to you. But how are they supposed to know? First, you'll see it's because he had nothing to gain in coming to Thessalonica. In fact, uh, he had everything to lose from a human perspective, at least. You see, when Paul and Silas came into uh, Thessalonica, they did not fly in on a private jet. They didn't come in 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 the Rolls Royce. Uh, They didn't come in luxury. In fact, they limped into that city, having been beaten with rods and falsely imprisoned in Philippi. You can find all of this in in Acts chapter 16. The treatment they received in Acts 16 back in Philippi was incredibly shameful. Stripped, beaten, in the middle of everyone, in the marketplace, naked, beaten, thrown in prison, shackled. You might remember the story while they're in prison, God breaks loose their chains, opens the doors of the jail, and the Philippian jailer is about to kill himself. And Paul says, don't do it. God delivered them from the despair that they faced there in Philippi, but they suffered. For any person who's interested in selfish gain, this is motivation to be quiet. The reason he would have been stripped, beaten, mocked, and imprisoned is is for the Philippians to say, hey, be quiet. Quit speaking the gospel. Paul's life would have been much easier if he would have simply zipped his lips about Jesus. But he couldn't keep quiet. He was compelled to continue preaching because he had been commissioned by God. And so what he's going to do is he's going to take about seven different motives that other preachers would have had when they traveled through this city, and he's going to say, we had none of those motives. None. My motives are pure. He says here in verse 3, our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive In Paul's day, people came through with all kinds of messages and all kinds of motives. Some were simply an error. They were just wrong. They had either been deceived themselves or or they had wandered away from the truth. But some, though, had more sinister motives. 
Paul uses this word, impure motives. This is likely connected, unfortunately, uh, to some kind of sexual immorality associated with, with cult practices. They were preaching a message in order to, to feed their flesh. Some preached with trickery and deception. These were the types of people called, Paul called peddlers of God's word in 2 Corinthians 2, 17. Preaching God's word for them was simply a means to a selfish end. Some, according to Paul, preached in order to please man. Church, listen, this is probably the thing that has most challenged me throughout this entire text. As I've prepared this week, I've just been so convicted on my own people pleasing. I am a recovering people pleaser. I stand up here before you and I want to be liked. I want to be approved of. I want your praise. In my flesh, I desire the approval of man. I love it. I love to be praised by men. I wonder if any of you here are people pleasers this morning. Do you realize that that's not a virtue? It's sin. In no way is it a virtue to seek approval from other people, to try to do whatever it takes to win their approval. Because once the approval of man ascends the throne of your heart, you will do or say, or you will not do or not say whatever it takes to gain that approval. You will certainly not seek to please God if, if, if seeking uh, the approval of man is your highest good. God must destroy that idol in our hearts if we are to, to live authentic lives for his glory. In verse five, Paul goes on to say that he and Silas did not come with words of flattery. They didn't come into Thessalonica and say, you know, God wants you to live your best life now. God wants you to just love yourself more. That's really what you need to do. You need to love yourself more. They didn't flatter the Thessalonians. <laughs> they preached a message of repentance. They said, you need to turn from your idols and, and live, believe in God. Reject the idols that you have set on the throne of your heart. Turn to God and live. Nor did they preach to make money. The gospel was not a pretext for greed, Paul says. We'll see in just a few moments that the apostles didn't take a penny from the Thessalonians, even though they could have. They certainly could have. There were no calls to sow into my ministry if you want to reap a reward. Pay, pay this tithe and you'll get a blessing from God. There was none of that from Paul. None of that from Silas. Because the gospel does not produce grifters. Lastly, Paul says they didn't seek glory. You see, glory is the bow that ties all of this together. It's the overarching theme of all these other false preachers. They all seek glory. They all use man to serve their own ends. See, you're, you're just a means to serve my flesh. I'm gonna preach to you in order that you might look at me and say, wow, isn't he cool? I wanna be like him. I wanna follow that guy. Everybody these false preachers coming through Thessalonica, they sought glory. If social media existed in the days of Paul, he would have never been called an influencer. He, would have not, he wouldn't have made the, the trending section on Twitter, or Instagram. He just wouldn't have because he wasn't out to build his brand. He didn't seek a platform, but he was content to be known and, and to be loved by God. Some of you here this morning seek glory. You want to be admired, whether it's by your boss, your parents, your coworkers, your teammates, your friends. Brothers and sisters, the praise of man is intoxicating. You must flee it because it only takes a little to get drunk. If you are in Christ, you are approved by God. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. What other, what other approval could you possibly Need, what longing do you have that Christ cannot satisfy? In Paul's defense of his motives, he calls on God as his witness. See in verse four, he claims it is God who tests our hearts. Paul can stand before the Thessalonians with a clear conscience because he knows in no way did he preach Christ for a vain, selfish goal. In the past few years, there have been several well-known cases of Christian leaders, pastors, preachers having disqualified themselves for reasons such as the ones I've just mentioned. 
They love money. They've served their flesh through sexual sin. They've abused the sheep to which they were called to care. The message of Jesus has unfortunately been co-opted by wolves throughout church history. And we shouldn't be surprised when we see it happening today. But brothers and sisters know that even when we can't assess the motives of those who preach Christ, the Lord sees it all. And all those who have preyed on God's sheep in order to serve their flesh, he will deal with severely. God will not be mocked in this way. And I know this is all about preachers and people who, who speak the words of Christ, but take this as a call to consider your own motives in your own relationships. Do you use people to serve your own ends? Do you manipulate others, your friends, your family, in order to gain something from them? That is not gospel love. The gospel calls us to give of ourselves, not take from others. The goal of these apostles was never to use man but to please God, Paul says. This is as authentic as it gets. My goal is to please God. The one living and true God who rules over the world has called me out of darkness, Paul says. He's commissioned me as an apostle. He's entrusted me with the gospel. He's approved of me as being one who has been entrusted with the gospel. And therefore, I don't seek approval of man. I seek to please him and him alone. He's my master. He's my commanding officer. It is for his pleasure, Paul says, that we speak. And oh, does he speak. Because the goal was to please God, verse two says, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. According to the apostles, pleasing God showed itself in declaring the gospel. Verse four, four, Paul says, so we speak. Pleasing God, church, and proclaiming the gospel go hand in hand. If you want to please God, speak the gospel. Speak the words of Christ to your fellow church members, to those around you, to the non-believers in your life. You might be thinking right now, though, but Craig, Paul's an apostle. I, I can't be like him. If that's you this morning, I want you to be encouraged by verse 2. Where does the boldness that Paul speaks with come from? It, does it come from his knowledge, his eloquence? No, certainly not. No, Paul says we had boldness in our God. It comes from God. Christian, if you are here this morning and you truly desire to please God, if you make pleasing God your chief aim, he will supply you with every ounce of boldness you need to speak the gospel with boldness, even in the midst of conflict, because pleasing God trumps personal safety. So pray, church, that God would empower you to please him. That is one prayer he is sure to answer. We move on in verses 6 to 8. Paul is going to make one more appeal to the sincerity of his motives. And that's going to be shown in the self-giving love that he has for the church. The end of verse 6 says, We, we could have made demands as apostles of Christ." But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. You see, Paul in, in his band of apostles carried a very unique weight of authority by virtue of having been with the risen Lord Jesus himself. What he said mattered, what he did mattered, and it held a weight. He had authority, authority that he could have used to serve his own flesh. When they strolled into Thessalonica, they could have made the next month all about them. They could have said, hey, you're going to need to put us in, up in the Hilton because after all, we need to be well rested in order to preach the gospel. We're going to demand five-star dinners every night because we need to be well nourished in order to preach the gospel. Paul didn't make any of those demands. Instead, their ministry was marked by self-giving love and care for this baby church. In fact, Paul is gonna use an incredible analogy. He's gonna compare his love for the church and the apostles' love for the church with a nursing mother caring for her own child. Some of you mothers know exactly what that means. 
I can read it and seek to understand, but I don't know it by experience. So this week I reached out to some new mothers in our church and asked, hey, how do you understand this verse? What What does this mean? What is this analogy trying to say? These are the responses I got. One mother said, the love I have for my child is unconditional, unwavering, committed, fully focused, undistracted, joyful, giving, tender. Another mom said, to be a nursing mother is to make myself wholly and unconditionally available at all hours to sustain my child. It is to respond with gentle compassion and genuine concern to to cries for help. It is to have a willingness to do anything and everything to comfort him. It's desiring his best and acting in a way that benefits him, regardless of the consequences to my body, sleep, and time, seeking nothing in return. The apostles so loved this baby church. This is a baby church, guys, three weeks old. Paul and, and Silas, they had delivered this church. It was an infant. And they gave themselves for that church. They loved that church. They poured themselves out for the sake of these baby believers. Because when the life transforming message of Jesus enters your life, you become significantly more concerned with the well being of others than you do yourself. You can't help it. Because the message of the gospel itself is that the all powerful, all knowing, all wise God of the universe has actually given himself to us in the form of a servant, his son. He laid down his rights. He had rights. He laid them down. He could have stayed in heaven. I don't need to come here. I don't have to deal with you people. Jesus could have said. He laid down those rights. He came to serve. And we believe, when we believe the message of the cross, God gives us a new heart with new desires to please him and to serve others. Instead of asking, what can you do for me? We ask, what can I do for you? How can I serve you Church, does that kind of selflessness mark your life today? Are you pouring yourself out for the sake of others? Or do you simply use others to get what you want? Do the people around you exist to serve you? Or do you exist to serve them? The authentic Christian life is marked by sincere, self-giving love. But next we see authentic Christianity not only shows itself in sincerity, It shows itself in sweat. Look at verse nine. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. The idea of the apostles' labor is the very specific way in which they showed their sincerity. You see, Paul's not against missionaries or pastors being supported by, by the church. In fact, Paul received support on many occasions from the church. This is the same Paul, after all, that said the laborer is deserving of his wages. But when the apostles came to Thessalonica, they decided to give up that right. They decided, you know what, we're not going to take money from you guys. We're instead going to go and get a job. We know from Acts 18, verse 3, Paul was probably a tent maker. Paul was a tent maker. And this is probably the kind of job that he worked while he was in Thessalonica. Why did he do this? Well, 2 Thessalonians 3.9 says, they did this in order to provide an example to the Thessalonians and to remove any potential obstacle that might hinder the gospel going forth. They, they knew that people, if they took money from them, they knew people would say, oh, you're just out here to take our money. You're just out here. This is, this is your grift. This is, the, this is your scheme, right? Paul says, no, no, no. We'll go work a job all day long in order that we can proclaim the gospel to you. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy rolled up their sleeves and went to work. They worked so much that they lost sleep in order to support themselves while in town. Did you see that? We worked night and day. What Paul probably means is we rose before sunrise, we started that work, and we worked all day long till the sun went down. Christian, do you realize that the way you work reflects back onto your Lord? Consider how you work. Are you lazy? Do you cheat on that time card when you go to work? Do you slip out 30 minutes early 
Do you work long hours? Are you a workaholic? Consider that the way in which you work actually reflects back on Jesus. It can authenticate the gospel or it can bring dishonor to Christ's name. You might be wondering, well, if they worked all day, then when in the world did they share the gospel? Well, they proclaimed the gospel while at work, Paul says. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. See, for Paul, the gospel was not just for one day of the week. It flooded every arena of his life, even the workplace. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that every day when you enter the workplace, you're entering the mission field? You're on mission. Christ rules over your vocational life every, every bit as much as he rules over your spiritual life. So pray that God would open doors for the gospel to go forth while you're at work, around the lunch table, in, in a meeting when your coworker just comes in because they've got to vent about that person that just ticked them off. They've got to vent. That's an opportunity to speak the gospel to that person because for Paul, no space is off limits for the gospel. Not even while he's sewing a tent together, he can preach the gospel there too. Because Paul's work was not an end in itself, nor is yours. All work in the Christian life is ultimately done for the glory of God. Missionaries aren't just people who go overseas. We praise God for Lari, she, that she would go to another country, but missionaries also flood the marketplace every single day. Students, do you recognize that your schools are a mission field? Do you realize that God has sovereignly placed that annoying student that sits right by you in class? Do you realize he's put, put that person there so that you could preach the gospel to that person? You're the, the person whose locker is next to you? None of that's by accident. You have opportunities to speak the gospel. You're not just a student, you're a missionary. In verse 10, Paul says, you are witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. You see their sweat was evidence of their sincerity. Whereas Paul used the image of a nursing mother earlier, he switches the, the metaphor up now and he uses the, the image of a father. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You see, though the apostles did a lot of manual labor while they were in Thess Thessalonica, probably the harder labor that they did was the spiritual labor the exhortation that it took to instruct these young baby Christians in the faith. Fathers, he uses the metaphor of, of you. You know how you care for your child, how you want to see their, their best, how you want only to ever see them succeed in the things that they set their minds to, because you care about them. In the ancient world, fathers were primarily responsible for teaching and instruction and admonition and righteousness. They're tender, yet firm. Paul here says, we exhorted, we encouraged, we charged. I think of the example of a father teaching his uh, daughter how to ride a bike. I see exhortation, I see encouragement, and I see charging all, all in bike riding. You could say to, to the child, keep the pedals turning. Steady the handlebars, use the, use the brakes. That's exhortation. But the child is young and inexperienced. She's gonna fall off that bike and she's gonna be discouraged. But you won't want to get back on the bike. So you say, it's okay. You'll get it next time. It takes time. So she starts going again, but she starts to veer off the road and she needs to be charged. No, stay on the road. Stay on the path. Is this not the essence of discipleship? Exhorting one another, encouraging one another, charging one another. It's hard spiritual work, church. It takes sweat. However, the promise is that as we labor in this way, according to Paul, we do it on the basis of God's calling us into his kingdom and into his glory. Our following Jesus and calling others to follow Jesus is motivated and sustained by God's electing grace in our lives. So authentic Christianity involves sweat. Church, who are you laboring over? Who are you exhorting, encouraging, Charging, 
Pastor Rod preached just a couple of weeks ago, there's a very real specific way in which you can do this. Just take one person and start reading through the book of James with them. You two can labor to exhort one another. It's a two-way street. God desires you to roll up your sleeves and go to work. I want to just speak, though, to the parents in the room. Uh, you have a unique opportunity to exhort your children, to encourage your children, to charge your children. And you probably feel, Craig, I've been laboring for years now, and I am exhausted. No, parents, that your labor is not in vain, that God sees yourself pouring, pouring you out. He sees you pouring yourself out for your children. And he will reward that. And he will give the empowering grace you need to keep doing that. Your labor, I promise you, is not in vain. So why do we work? Well, we work because God himself is at work, bringing about the salvation of sinners, which is our third point this morning. Authentic Christianity shows itself in salvation. Verse 13 says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of God, not, not as the word of men, but as, as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. At this point in, in the passage, Paul's going to shift from talking about the authentici authenticity of his own faith and his own Christianity to talk about the authenticity of the Thessalonian church. And it's proven by their genuine acceptance of the gospel message. I mean, imagine yourself living in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago. You, you inhabit a world in which the gods uh, are sovereign over everything, where there's many gods. Uh, so you, you want to go out uh, on, on a trip to the sea, you pray to Zeus, and you, you just hope that you'll appease him. You want your crops to spring up in uh, the, the, the spring or summer months, and so you pray to Artemis. You offer that sacrifice because you need, it's transactional. I need something out of this God. You're struggling with childbirth and so you pray to Aphrodite. Aphrodite, help me. I wanna have kids. Then one day, a preacher from a thousand miles away named Paul strolls into your city and he starts preaching about this crazy idea that God has actually revealed himself in some Jewish man over in Judea. This Jewish man was perfect and he, he took our, my, sac, my sins on, on a cross and sacrificed himself for me. And then he didn't just stay dead, he somehow rose from the grave. I've never seen anything like that. I mean, th this is the message that's coming to them. It sounds silly. There, many people in the city thought, that is insane, Paul. But some believed. To some, it all made sense. They heard the message of the gospel and they believed. Their hearts were full of the good soil that Jesus had talked about just years prior. And the seed of the gospel took root in them and a church was birthed. And therefore, Paul had great reason to thank God. He knew that this was the work of God. He knew Isaiah 55, 11, that as God's word falls down, it's like the rain. When the rain falls, it, it waters the earth. It always accomplishes the purpose for which, for which God set it, set it out to purpose. And to accomplish in the same way when God's word goes forth, it always accomplishes everything that God planned for it to accomplish. Paul knew that. And so as the word went out, people believed just as, as it always does. And they believed that it was from God and not man. That's what our message is, isn't it? A word from God. I don't stand up here and preach to you my opinion. I've got nothing helpful to say apart from the authority of what this book says. We gather to hear from the living God through his word. The Thessalonians believed the gospel to be the word of God and it changed their lives. And the authenticity of such salvation was confirmed as the word of God began to work in them. You see that here. Which you heard from us, you, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Once selfish people now put the needs of others before their own. Once, gre once greedy people now considered giving away their money and their wealth. Once idol worshipers forsook their idols and followed the one God revealed in Christ. Because that's what the word does when it takes root in someone. It's living and it's active and it transforms the lives of all those it takes root, 
root in. If you're here and you've never accepted this word to be from God, you can do that this morning. I pray that you wouldn't leave here without considering whether the words in this book are just some baloney made up by man or if they're the words of the living God who will hold you accountable for what you do with them. If you're a Christian this morning, thank God that he opened your eyes to see that this book is not just any other book, but it's the the, the word from the living God given to you for your good. Well, how is this salvation being verified? By the suffering the church is enduring, which is our last point. Authentic Christianity shows itself in suffering. Look at verses 14 to 16. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displease God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So always as to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. The early churches were no strangers to suffering. Following Jesus was not a private matter for them. Pledging allegiance to Jesus held social, economic, political, and physical consequences. The Thessalonian church was uniquely familiar with suffering as the church itself had experienced a chaotic, a chaotic opposition from its inception. Remember, a riot formed as soon as the church was birthed. And this was no surprise to the early church. Jesus had promised, in this life, you will have trouble. Does that mean that the church went looking for trouble? No. And that doesn't mean you you should go looking for trouble. But they did endure it when it came. For Paul, that was a clear sign of their authenticity. As Paul wrote to this church, he sought to encourage them, hey, you're not alone in your suffering. In fact, you're part of a pattern of suffering churches going back to the beginning of the Christian movement. This, This is a comforting thought. Oh, other people are doing this too and they're staying faithful? Okay, I can stay faithful. Church, in this regard, I think we actually have a lot to learn from our suffering brothers and sisters all across the world. Right now, brothers and sisters in China are forced to meet in secret. In North Korea, Christians are being detained in labor camps. Our brothers and sisters in Iran are being disowned by their families, forsaking they forsake their families and they follow Jesus. Yet, in all their suffering church, they have considered Christ worth following in the midst of any suffering. May their faithfulness encourage us to stand firm in the faith. Because the reality is that most of us have never suffered anything to the likes of the Thessalonian church. Most of us have really not faced social, economic, political, or physical consequences for following Jesus. But let me tell you, we should not assume that such opposition will never come our way in America. Just as the Thessalonians' countrymen turned on them, so yours can turn on you. I don't say this to invoke fear. I say this to encourage you to stand firm when the time comes. Some of you here this morning lament the direction this country is going. You feel as though Christians are losing ground in various culture wars. You worry that cancel culture will soon make its way to Jesus himself. And guess what? It might. It might. But let me tell you something. Jesus does not need America in order to advance his church. If prayer is not allowed in schools, the church will survive. If the phrase one nation under God is taken out of the pledge, the church will survive. If churches lose their tax-exempt status, the church will survive. Are these blessings for which we can be thankful for? Absolutely. Are they necessary in order for the church to advance? Absolutely not. You wanna know why? Because it's not man-made laws that protect and advance God's church. It's God himself. And he has promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. A third century theologian named Tertullian said it best. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Christian, you might not ever be called to martyrdom, but you should prepare to suffer. 
He moves on to say that all opposition to God's people is part of a larger pattern of opposition to God himself. Paul notes in verse 15 that the hostility the Thessalonians faced was merely a continuation of a pattern which had been very specifically manifested among the unbelieving Jews of his day. You see, although there had always been a remnant of faithful Jews going going back to, to the earliest days of Israel, many Jews, in fact, most Jews often uh, were in opposition to God in his work in the world, in his word. You see this, especially in the Old Testament prophets. Think back to the prophet Elijah. In fact, 1 Kings 19.10, Elijah proclaims, the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. covenant. They've thrown down your altars, God. They've killed your prophets with the sword. This is Israel killing its prophets. And I, even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Later, the prophet Jeremiah was cast into a pit and left for dead. Ultimately, he was taken down into Egypt. He lived the rest of his life in Egypt outside of the land of promise. John the Baptist was imprisoned and beheaded because he would dare to speak against the king who was Jewish. All the unbelief and opposition from the unbelieving Jews led Jesus himself to pronounce judgment on them as he wept over the spiritual state of Jerusalem. Listen to what he says in Luke 13, 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus laments over the fact that the Jews stand in opposition to God himself because they stand in opposition to the gospel. And although it was the Romans who drove the nails into Jesus' hands, Peter leaves no doubt on the day of Pentecost in his sermon that it was, on, it was the blood of the hands, uh, Jesus' blood were on the hands of the Jews, he says in Acts 2.23. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified, you killed by the hands of lawless men. All this opposition to the prophets, to Jesus and to the apostles was not mere opposition to men. It was opposition to God himself. To prevent a messenger of the gospel from speaking the life-saving words of the gospel is to set yourself against God Almighty. Do you realize that? You're not just setting yourself against a man. You're setting yourself against God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe that to be true? Do you realize that there's no fence riding in this? There are two sides. Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. You who are riding the fence today, pick a side. These, kinds of, these opponents of the gospel not only oppose God, they oppose all mankind. They hinder the world from hearing the only message of hope that could possibly save them and God will not let that sin slide because everyone who finds themselves set against God and his gospel are daily storing up wrath against themselves. Look at the end of verse 16. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. Every act of evil committed in this life is known and measured by God. Do you realize that? I mean, some of you think that you're, you're good with God because he hasn't struck you with a lightning bolt yet. Do you realize that God's patience is not meant to be mistaken for his absence? Do not be deceived. Evil has an expiration date. In the same way that God allowed the Canaanites to reach the full measure of their sins before sending in the Israelites to conquer them, all those who oppose God's son today, right now, are heaping up wrath against themselves and it will be poured out on the day of judgment. Wrath will come upon all the enemies of God. You can bet your life on it. If you're not a Christian today, hear this. 
This is a warning. You don't have to face such a judgment if you would but turn to Christ. Because the same God who vows to pour out his wrath on his enemies has sent his son into the world to save his enemies. Jesus Christ took on flesh so that he could take upon himself the sins of the world. He willingly suffered and laid down his life for his enemies. The wrath of God that was intended for you instead has fallen on Jesus. If you would but turn to him, Jesus died in order that you might live. And he rose from the grave and calls you today to turn from your sins and to believe in him. And if you do that, your sins will be cast as far as the east is from the west. God will never remember them again. He will never hold them against you. You can do that today. You can turn to God and live. Maybe you're here and, and uh, you would call yourself a, a Christian or you at least think yourself to be a Christian like, like Jaylee mentioned earlier, but you're really just deep faking it. You, you may fool people around you, but you won't fool God. If you look at your life and you realize, you know what, I actually don't believe in Jesus. I don't live the way he's called me to live. You can turn to him today. There's grace for you. God desires that you would. In every way, guys, that we have lived in authentic lives for the Lord, he took that sin. He took it all so that we could live authentic lives for his glory. Flee to Jesus today and live.